lives are, are spared. All right, anyway, we're in Matthew 24, verse 36. So, uh, again, the Olivet Dis- Discourse grows out of uh, questions the disciple asks Jesus uh, when he tells them that one day the temple is going to get destroyed. Uh, so they wanted to know when. And the answer, as we said a few weeks ago, is not recorded in Matthew, but is recorded in, in the response in Luke 21, 20, where Jesus said, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, uh, then know that its desolation is near, the, the, the temple. Uh, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Uh, let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written to me be fulfilled. So, uh, so he does answer that question. Uh, when will, and not one stone will be left on another. Wow, when is that going to happen? Well, when you see the uh, siege uh, of, uh, around the city, know that that's when it's going to happen. Of course, that did occur in 70 AD. Uh, the second question they asked uh, about the sign of his return uh, and... Uh, uh, and the sign of the end of the age. Uh, and these are, uh, again, Jesus gave signs that would indicate his second coming is near. So there would be a series of signs, and we went through those a few weeks ago. And then he compared them to a woman in labor. So these signs will grow in intensity uh, and in terms of their how close they are together in time uh, leading up to the sign of his uh, return uh, which uh, we said last week uh, is basically uh, God's visible presence that every, every eye will see as he returns to planet Earth. We likened it, or I believe it's really the Shekinah glory of God that people will see. Uh, this is all when Christ returns, Revelation 19, to uh, establish his, uh, his kingdom. Uh, and, uh, and those signs, are we said, were meant to be uh, an encouragement to the Jewish remnant that is hanging on, surviving during that last half uh, of the tribulation uh, and the illustration of the fig tree. But again, in Luke's gospel, it's the fig tree and trees. Uh, When you see, uh, again, these certain things happening, you know that summer is near. Uh, You see them blossom, you know that summer is near. So to the Jewish remnant uh, in that last half of the tribulation, uh, when they see these signs in great frequency, uh, coming closer and closer together. It's meant to be an encouragement to them to hang on because the ultimate sign, which is God's Shekinah glory returning to planet Earth, uh, is coming soon. Uh, Now, uh, in verse 36, it begins with a contrasting term, but. Uh, But in comparison to those things, in comparison to the tribulation period, uh, which begins when the Jewish nation, Israel, signs an agreement with the Antichrist uh, to help them restore and rebuild their temple, uh, you can count off seven years, uh, and then Jesus Christ will return. You can count off three and a half years, or 1,260 days, uh, and the Antichrist will enter that temple that's been rebuilt, uh, erect an image of himself, bring it to life, and demand to be worshipped as God. Then you can count the other 100 to, uh, 100. 1,260 days. But Jesus says here in verse 36, but, but in contrast to that, now I'm going to talk about an event that is very different than that, one in which there's no time sequence, nobody knows the the day or the hour. So he's going to begin to talk about what we refer to as the rapture uh, of the church. Paul mentions it, uh, kind of the classic uh, passage, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, uh, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another uh, with these words. And um, and it's such um, such a great uh, uh, passage of scripture in and of itself. Uh, just to study, and, uh, and it is meant to be uh, one of great encouragement. And one of the key uh, lines in it is together with them. Uh, that means at the, uh, when the rapture happens, when we are caught up together uh, with everyone that's gone before us, every family member, your grandparents, whoever they might be, uh, your best friend, uh, whoever it is, when we're caught up, we will be together with them. 
uh, that means that uh, we won't be running around through the uh, myriads of thousands upon thousands of people trying to find them. It means we'll be instantaneously with them. Uh, and uh, that, that's exactly uh, what, it, what it means, together with them. And that's why it's meant to be uh, a great uh, statement of uh, encouragement. Uh, death is the great separator, but Jesus Christ is the great reconciler. And he, uh, he brings us all together uh, in, in that moment of time and space. When Jesus raised the, the widow's son from the dead, he tenderly delivered him to uh, his mother. Uh, this suggests that our Lord will have the happy ministry of reuniting broken families and friendships all in that moment. And that's why the rapture of the church uh, for 2,000 years has been such uh, an important subject to, to believers. Uh, uh, the idea of what it will mean to us. There will be a generation that actually won't see death but all generations have been looking to the rapture, knowing that it could occur in their particular uh, gen generation, together with them in the same exact time uh, and space. Well, let's get to this passage, Matthew 24, uh, 36, and there's our very key word. I'll point out a few others as we go through here. Uh, but of that day and hour, no one knows, uh, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, it's going to be our first illustration, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And I'll make reference to that word took in a minute, if you're kind of an underliner. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken. We'll make reference to that. It's actually a different Greek word. And the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken uh, and the other left. We'll make note of uh, all, all of those words uh, that are important here. But note first that there's a future event uh, and the timing is secret uh, in these first five verses. So only the father knows the timing of the event. Uh, verse 36, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father uh, only. Again, we know the timing uh, of Jesus Christ returning to planet Earth, as I, I just mentioned. Uh, second coming of Jesus uh, is going to be marked off during the tribulation period. So it's, uh, uh, it's a time that we know exactly when he will return once the covenant is signed with Israel and the Antichrist that helps them restore uh, and build the temple. Secondly, Noah becomes the illustration of this event. So again, if it's like the days of Noah, what were the days of Noah like? Uh, why does God bring a sweeping judgment upon the earth the way that he does uh, during the time of judgment? Because those are going to be the conditions, apparently, that kind of set the stage for the rapture of the church. Uh, back in Genesis 6-5, it says of those days, uh, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace uh, in the eyes of the Lord. So the portrait that Moses, again the writer of Genesis, gives of the pre-flood culture uh, is that of what we might call a thoroughly demonized civilization. Uh, and of course, uh, that's why it was destroyed by the flood. Uh, there has been other reoccurrences of uh, similar circumstances uh, a few times on the planet where a culture becomes uh, uh, pretty much thoroughly demonized. Uh, one would be um, uh, the Canaanite culture that God had judged uh, through Joshua when he enters the land uh, and it becomes the land of Israel. Uh, they were a culture that was infamous for their violence uh, and their sensuality. During the Herodians uh, of Christ's lifetime, uh, they were also, as one writer said, a cesspool of sensuality uh, and violence. Then you have uh, a Nero and Caligula and their Roman courts uh, come to mind and also the depravity of, uh, of the Third Reich. Keep, keep in mind that uh, Nero was a guy uh, that would take Christians and dip them in tar, uh, put them on stakes in his garden, 
and light them on fire so he'd be able to ride his chariot uh, through his garden at night as the Christians burned. That was Nero, the guy running, uh, running, the, uh, running the show there uh, for, for Rome. Caligula is, uh, is right there uh, with him. Uh, again, uh, why should the past depravity concern us today? It's because Jesus said that he would return in a time like those times, like the times of Noah. So what are the, what are the signs of Noah? Well, I've got a few for you. One is population explosion. Again, this is if we took the time and went back and did a thorough study uh, in Genesis, we'd find one of the signs is a population uh, explosion. There are probably... Uh, Millions, if not uh, billions, of uh, uh, of people that lived on the planet uh, when uh, during the days of Noah. If we used a, a formula that simply gave each family four children, multiplied uh, those by the uh, the families uh, in the 1,656 1, uh, years of recorded history, uh, then we would put the population in millions and billions. But keep in mind, they probably had a lot more than four kids each, because. Uh, uh, you've got Enoch having children at the age of 65. You've got Noah living to uh, being 500 years old. So uh, these could have been huge families. Uh, and again, the population in the millions, but probably uh, in the billions. Well, how, how are we doing today? The world population today uh, is, uh, is 7.131 billion, according to the United States Census uh, of uh, about two years ago, March 2012. Uh, the world population, uh, they said at that time, uh, experienced continuous growth since the end of the Great Fathom, uh, Famine and the Black Death in 1350 when it stood around 370 million. So after those events took place and there was a tremendous decrease uh, in the world's population, it's been growing and growing and growing and growing. Uh, and now we've, we've reached that period where the population again, is uh, in tremendous growth cycle, as in the days uh, of Noah. Second, there was uh, moral deterioration. Uh, again, Paul connects the last days with this uh, moral breakdown in 2 Timothy 3.1, where he says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. No, I wasn't just describing from Webster's Dictionary a definition of the American culture. That's actually in the Bible. And, uh, and I would just point out only just even one aspect of that. Basically, all children will raise the same in all cultures through all time as far as we know. And they were all raised the same way in that they had to respect authority. And they had to respect their parents over them. It's the way every culture uh, around the globe. And that stayed that way until the 1960s. And basically parenting uh, and child training got reinvented uh, uh, when Spock writes his book, a few people read it, a few more, and, uh, uh, and it's very different now. And, uh, and you, do, you do have, you have, a lot of, you have a lot of kids out there that are not, uh, uh, and, and I, I'm not just talking about uh, don't go to bed on time as far as being disobedient. Uh, this is really talking about, uh, they have a tendency towards violence, uh, and they are incredibly disrespectful and so forth. Not that everywhere, but it's like that in a lot of a lot of places. And um, uh, you know, what, when I when I was <laughs> growing up, if I was uh, uh, out on the streets with my buddies uh, hanging out and it was getting dark, one of my neighbors would come out. Or if one drove by in his car, he would stop his car and go, "You boys, get on home. It's getting dark out here. You better get on home." You know what we'd say? We'd say, "Yes, sir," and we'd run home. Now, if I did that on my my street in Kaneohe. They'd be giving me hand signals, right? And it's not the and it's not the shaka. You know, it's just different. It's a different it's a different world that's uh, that's out there. But uh, very very interesting. Uh, according to two notable experts, experts on the Babylonian Talmud, uh, they say at the time, in terms of the sensuality part, uh, at the time of Noah, 
Same-sex marriage was prevalent just before the Great Flood. Uh, and I, I find that uh, more than a little uh, uh, coincidental here. Jeffrey Satinover, who holds an MD from Princeton, doctorates from Yale, MIT, and Harvard, has made the point that the Midrash, Rabbah Genesis, suggests such activity represented the last straw before God unleashed the floodwaters to destroy uh, the earth. And, uh, and of course, uh, as uh, predicted, uh, one definition of marriage, uh, once it's changed, uh, other, other relationships uh, change as well. And, uh, and we've got uh, a, lot, a lot of very strange things going on in our culture today, you know, along with the redefinition uh, of, uh, of marriage. Uh, and uh, even though states have taken the uh, courts of action to pass state constitutional amendments to uh, ensure uh, marriages between one man and one woman, even though we passed a federal law called DOMA, Domestic uh, Defense of Marriage Act, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that agenda is, has been uh, moving forward. Courts, federal courts have been uh, uh, striking traditional marriage down left and right just in this last year. This is from Ken uh, Kulusko. Uh, Klukowski, excuse me, who is the uh, director, Center for Religious Liberty at the Family Research uh, Council. We had the uh, chance to hear him a few years ago, uh, but he says this in an article December 14th, 2013 that was published on Breitbart.com. He said, in a game changer for the legal fight over same-sex marriage that gives credence to opponents' slippery slope arguments a federal judge has now ruled that the legal reasoning for same-sex marriage means that laws against polygamy are likewise unconstitutional. In his 91-page opinion in Brown v. Buham on uh, December 13th, U.S. District Judge Clark Wadrup struck down Utah's law making polygamy a crime. In so doing, he may have opened Pandora's box. So th this whole thing is what's going to happen what's going to be okay uh, and so forth in terms of uh, not just homosexual marriage, but we're going way beyond that now uh, because the, the reasoning that made that legal, the same reasoning can be applied to any, uh, any relationship uh, at all. Uh, in November a year ago, the Senate, the U.S. Senate, didn't get all the way through, but they tried, they passed a version of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, a bill that creates special status for sexual orientation and gender identity uh, in the workplace. Uh, if, that could, if that had passed the House, and if it had gone to President Obama uh, who, uh, and he signed it, then uh, on your workplace, if you ever said anything against anyone else in terms of disagreeing uh, with their choices sexually uh, in marriage or, or, or otherwise, uh, you would have had charges brought to you because you would be in a hostile work environment, and you'd be creating a hostile work environment for your homosexual co-workers and so forth, uh, and you would be disciplined or dismissed from your job. That, that passed the U.S. Senate under Harry Reid. Uh, but uh, uh, we're, we're getting close to these things. And of course, the, uh, we remember the headlines of not that long ago when, um, uh, when um, involving A&E and Duck Dynasty uh, when Phil Robinson was uh, interviewed uh, in a GQ article and they had asked him what he considered sin and he named off a bunch of stuff and among that homosexuality and all of a sudden, boom, he's gone, the show's gone, there was a big outcry and um, uh, and he decided not to lose millions of fans uh, every week uh, and they were bought, uh, brought back on and we could go on with other um, uh, illustrations of that, and I bring, I, I, I make that the illustration uh, because it, it shows how far we've gone. Uh, it's not to say that other kind of sexual sin is somehow okay. It's not. It's just to say we're, how far the pendulum has swung. Uh, we're in the days of Noah. In that sense, we live in a very morally corrupt culture. Three, there's an increase in violence uh, and uh, during Noah's day. If you go back and, uh, and look at it, uh, and, of course, the, the violence that comes to mind initially uh, has to be uh, abortion, uh, making Germany's Holocaust pale in comparison. Uh, 56 million have been killed by abortion. But not only that, the World Health Organization in Geneva, and this was uh, about 10 years ago, uh, said the following. The 20th century will be remembered as a century marked by violence. 
It burdens us with its legacy of mass destruction of violence inflicted on a scale never seen and never possible before in human history. But this legacy, the results of new technology uh, in the service of ideologies of hate, is not only the one we carry, uh, nor the one we must face up to. Less visible, but even more widespread, is the legacy of day-to-day individual suffering. It is the pain of children who are abused by people who should protect them. Women injured or humiliated by violent partners. Elderly persons maltreated by their caregivers. Youths who are bullied by other youths. And people of all ages who inflict violence on themselves. Uh, and of course, we could, we could go on and on. That's a, this, this is not a Bible scholar saying that. This is a World Health Organization saying that uh, we live in an unprecedented time in terms of violence uh, in our culture. Again, that's one of the characteristics uh, of the days of Noah. The fourth one is demonic activity. Uh, and uh, demonic, uh, demonic worship has been co- completely legitimized uh, in the last, uh, last 20 years. Uh, it was only a few years ago uh, that uh, the United States Air Force Academy had to set aside and build a place in the woods uh, uh, up, up above the, the campus uh, for those that are involved in Wicca uh, so they could have their own place of worship up there. It was like one staff sergeant, two cadets or something, but they had to spend the money and, uh, and build, build this whole thing because so they, they have to make an accommodation uh, for people involved in, uh, in Wicca. Uh, and, uh, and there's, of course, uh, we, we've got the, the whole arena of, um, of demoniz- demonism being portrayed from, from kids' cartoons, you know, right up through the, the movies and, uh, and so forth. Uh, a year ago in Colorado, after an elk was shot, uh, people gathered around together for a vigil for the elk, holding hands and singing Amazing Grace. They gave a eulogy, uh, and uh, yet at the same day, 4,000 children were killed through, uh, through abortion, and uh, no, nobody said a word. Uh, we're just like, we're, we're a little off base here in terms of, in terms of a culture. We've seen an increasing aggressiveness from atheists that mock Christians, try to demonize, marginalize them, uh, anyone that adheres to the Christian faith. Uh, we've actually had to have legislation passed in the last year to stop the discrimination against people in the military who uh, maybe wore a cross or cited a Bible verse or uh, asked somebody if they wanted prayer or something like that. Uh, they're out fighting for other people's freedom, uh, and then they're denied those basic freedoms themselves. Uh, it's still it's still a problem uh, in the military. I know it's a problem in a lot of workplaces as well. Again, what kept people from listening to Noah's message and obeying? Well, notice it was just common, ordinary things. Uh, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. We would say they lost the best by living for the good. Uh, it's a dangerous thing when we get so absorbed in the pursuit of this life that we forget Jesus is coming. Uh, and that's the point of the illustration. Uh, notice Jesus' words again, for in the days uh, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. In other words, despite the conditions around them, you know, demonic, violent, uh, and, uh, and so forth, most people just figure it's, this is just the way it is, and it's just going to keep right on going, just like this. Uh, we're really okay. And then a huge cataclysmic event came uh, and people were shocked. No one his family are removed, and God's judgment uh, comes. That's the illustration. No one his family are removed, and then the judgment comes. Uh, the last part of this, though, is not everyone will be ready for this future event. Uh, who's taken away? Verse uh, 40 to 41. Uh, then two men will be in the field. Uh, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, uh, and the other left. Again, another uh, illustration. Uh, there, there's a couple of different views uh, of this. Uh, one is uh, seen as the people that are being taken are being taken away uh, in, into judgment. Uh, and they, uh, rather than see that um, the word but being the contrasting term that takes us to a new subject, uh, they take this and tie it in with the end of the tribulation that we were looking at last week. Uh, and they say they're taken uh, into, uh, into judgment. Uh, but uh, again, 
Uh, I think the uh, rapture of the church is clearly uh, in view here. Uh, and I made reference to uh, the word took and, and, uh, and taken. Verse 39, uh, and did of, of those in Noah and did not know until the flood came and took them away. Uh, that's a verb that means to be violently taken away. Uh, it is um, aero, it's a primary root. It means to lift up by implication, take away. Uh, and it certainly applies uh, to those in the flood. They were taken away uh, very violently. Uh, but then when you get to our words here about the men and the women that were just working and then uh, they were taken, uh, it's a very different word. It's the Greek word paralabano. Uh, it means uh, they're taken in terms of comfort. Uh, that, that's very, very different. Uh, it's the same word that's used over in John, uh, in John 14, 3, uh, where Jesus says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you that's our same greek word receive you to myself that where i am uh, there you may be also uh, so uh, again i think that's what's in view here is the rapture uh, uh, a couple of guys are working and boom one's gone and one's left behind a couple of gals are working boom one's gone one is left behind where are they taken are they taken violently no they're taken in comfort is what the greek says uh, so they're they're taken in the rapture, I believe, to be with the Lord. So there's a future event, and the timing is secret. Um, uh, the moment it happens, uh, we won't know until the moment it happens. But Jesus gives us indicators uh, so that uh, we would know when it's about to happen. And it will happen when uh, we are living in a time just like the time uh, of Noah right before the flood. Uh, and then secondly... Uh, there are four exhortations in regards to the rapture, uh, and they all take uh, the place in terms of, uh, of parables. The first parable is in verse 43. Uh, uh, verse 42, the exhortation, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, uh, but know this. Here's the first illustration. That if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not uh, expect. So Jesus says we should be watchful, uh, verse 42. Uh, we should be seeing the signs around us that lead up to uh, Jesus coming for the church in terms of the ra rapture. Uh, he expects us to be faithful, to be working until he returns. The word watch means to be alert, to stay at one's best. It means to stay awake. So the exhortation is to... Uh, is to be watching. Uh, the second parable is in verse 45 to 51. And all these exhortations, we'll kind of go over them at the end, and, uh, and uh, hopefully this will kind of all come together uh, for us. Verse 45, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom the master has made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, uh, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, uh, they, he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards, uh, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and will cut him in two, and appoint him as portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, again, so the, uh, the ruler of a house could be seen as the, the leaders over uh, uh, of the church or the house of God. Uh, it's uh, who then is a faithful and wise servant, it says, whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Uh, again, Warren Wordsby says this uh, about this whole thing. So this sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? <clears throat> the guy's not ready. What do we do with him? Just cut him in two, man, and just throw him out there where there's weeping and gnashing in teeth. We have weeping and gnashing at our house, weeping and gnashing of teeth at our house. Uh, but it's because we have a two-year-old there. But um, you, you may have some of that around your house as well. But um, that happens sometimes with smaller kids. But this is probably a little more serious here. But it still is just meant to, it's just a, an illustration. It's meant to be a metaphor. So Warren Worsby says, I prefer to translate Matthew 24, 51, 
and shall punish him severely and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Even in that day of despotic rule, it would be unthinkable for a master to cut a servant in half. The whole picture is one of pain and loss. This does not suggest punitive measures at the judgment seat of Christ because uh, we will have glorified bodies. But it does suggest loss of reward and loss of opportunity. So here's an illustration. and I, the, Obviously, I agree with that or I wouldn't be reading it. Uh, that that's what's, uh, what's in mind here. There are Christians living as in the days of Noah. Uh, the rapture of the church comes and they are not ready. In fact, they're saying... Uh, I think they've been saying that for like a hundred years, so I really could care less about that. I mean, when I die, I die, and that's going to be it. I'm not going to live my life like somehow Jesus is going to come at any moment. I'm just not doing that. Uh, and, and apparently that kind of an attitude will be punished in terms of for a believer at the judgment seat of Christ where we're giving rewards for what we've done with the time, talent, and treasures that God has given us. But in this case, again, there's a loss of reward, and there's a loss of opportunity. The opportunity is uh, in the millennial age to rule and reign with Christ. Not everybody rules and reigns with Christ. I mean, we're all going to rule and reign, but, uh, but some people are, I don't know that you'd want their job. I'm sure they're going to be very happy, uh, but some are going to be a little, little better than others. Uh, it's just a loss of reward and a loss of opportunity. I don't think anybody's literally going to get cut in half. We're going to be in our glorified bodies. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it, it's an illustration to say something went wrong in this person's heart because they stopped expecting the Lord to return. And, of course, the exhortation is to be ready, to be watching for the rapture of, of the church. And you can read the book of Acts and you can read the epistles. And I'll guarantee you you'll find one thing. Peter, James, and John, and all those guys were living, believing Christ would come for them at any day. That was 2,000 years ago. And Christians, through the years, through the centuries, have all believed and felt the same way, because it could. Uh, but there's an exhortation here that you might want to look around <laughs> to see if you're living in the days of Noah or not, uh, because uh, that's one of, the, uh, one of the illustrations here. Uh, and then there's a, a parable here. As we get into chapter 25 and the uh, uh, first 13 verses, the next parable is, uh, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their uh, lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So the same exhortation to watch uh, and be ready. A, a Jewish wedding feast had two parts. The bridegroom and his friends would go from his house and claim the bride uh, from her parents. Uh, then the bride and the groom would return to the groom's house for the marriage feast. Uh, the church uh, has uh, uh, known for 2,000 years that Jesus would come again, uh, yet uh, many believers live pretty much a lethargic, drowsy life, we might say, no longer uh, excited about the soon coming of the Lord. So you've got oil burning, and the oil burning certainly reminds us of the oil used in the tabernacle services, uh, and uh, usually a, a symbol for the, the Spirit of God. So basically, the bridegroom comes and calls at the midnight hour. There are a group of people uh, that have the oil. They have the Holy Spirit, and they are ready to go in the rapture. 
there's another group of people that were also referred to in that same group. They appeared to be virgins and so forth without the oil, without the Holy Spirit, and they did not go in the rapture. Is this a partial rapture th theory? No, it's just only Christians are going to go in the rapture. It doesn't matter if you attended church once. It doesn't matter if you got baptized once. It's whether you're really saved or not. And that's the exhortation here. Watch, therefore, and be ready. How are you to be ready? <laughs> you better be saved. Uh, make sure of your, uh, of your own salvation. Uh, that's what this uh, illustration uh, is all, all about. Uh, that's how you're ready and watching uh, according to this, is that uh, you've given your life to Jesus Christ, uh, and you know that uh, uh, when, uh, when he comes for the church, you will go uh, with the church. So that, that was, uh, again, a very, everything is watching therefore, but all these things have a little different twist on what they mean uh, to the person listening and to, to us tonight. Uh, the fourth par uh, parable is in verse 14 to 30. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called to his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, and to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Uh, then he who had received the five talents went and traded them uh, and made them another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two uh, gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Uh, so he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, uh, you have delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Lord, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him. Give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. <coughs> there will be weeping and gnashing uh, of teeth. Again, so a couple things about, uh, 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 you know, again, we could do a lot of teaching just in principle about being faithful and so forth. Uh, apart from uh, its real meaning and context, which is talking about the rapture of the church. But uh, note that each servant in the parable was given money. A talent was worth about 20 years' wages. So, so whatever. So even the guy that only got one, that's not shabby, right? That, I, don't know, I don't know what that's, that's worth. That's, that's a lot of money that guy got. Um, uh, the man... Uh, with much ability, notice they were based on ability. The man with the most ability was given five talents. The man with average ability was given two talents. And the man with minimal ability still received one, one talent. So again, explanations and meetings. The talents represent opportunities to use our abilities. The five talents were given to a person with minimal ability. Uh, he'd be destroyed with the heavy responsibility. But he's only given one. Uh, the Lord knows how to equate and give based on ability. Based on ability, opportunity uh, is given. Uh, secondly, God assigns work and opportunity, again, according to ability. So each of us are given gifts and talents. Each of us are given time. Each of us are given different things that we can use for the Lord. Uh, it's in, in varied uh, in, uh, in degree. 
Uh, Billy Graham's had a lot of opportunity. Greg Laurie has a lot of opportunity. It doesn't mean that all of us aren't called to evangelism. Uh, it's, it's different for all of us. The three servants, no matter how much their ability was or how much opportunity they were given, they all fell into one of two categories. They were either faithful or they were unfaithful. That's what it came down to. The faithful servants took their talents, uh, put them to work for the Lord. The unfaithful servant hid his talent in a hole in the ground. Instead of using his opportunity, he buried him. Uh, he did not purposely do evil. He did not purposely do evil. But by doing nothing, he was committing sin and robbing the Lord of an increase that would have come. The two men who put their money to work each received the same commendation. It was not the portion, but the proportion that made the difference. They started as servants, and when they got done, they were rulers. They all started as servants. The faithful guys ended up as rulers. They were faithful in a few things, so now the Lord will trust them with many things. The third servant was unfaithful, therefore unrewarded, because he was afraid that he might fail. He never tried to succeed. He feared of life. He feared of responsibility. He was paralyzed with anxiety. So he buried his talent uh, in order to protect it uh, again. But the master says, hey, the least you could have done is put it in the bank and made, uh, made some interest. There's no risk in that. So what we do not use for the Lord, we're in danger of losing. Whatever talent, whatever treasure, you know, the time, uh, whatever we don't use for the Lord, we're in danger of losing. The master represent, reprimanded the unfaithful, unprofitable servant, and then he even took his talent uh, away from him uh, and gave it to the guy that already had ten. Some feel that this unprofitable servant was not a true believer. Uh, so we're, we're seeing God deal with believers and unbelievers differently. But again, the outer darkness here uh, need not refer to, to hell. Uh, again, it's just an analogy. Uh, it's an illustration. Uh, we don't build a theology uh, of someone's salvation when we're talking about the rapture uh, of the church. Uh, it's just to show us that the Lord will come one day uh, very quickly uh, in the twinkling of an eye, Paul says, uh, in, the, in all opportunity to do something for him at that juncture uh, will, will be gone. And, uh, and that's the point of the illustration, the things that we can uh, we can learn from it. So uh, each of these, so there's a, uh, we know when Jesus is coming back to planet Earth, uh, again, his coming again the second time, uh, we can count off the days in the tribulation period. But, but different than that, uh, there's a time when he's coming for the church in the air and no one knows the day or the hour. It's going to be suddenly, it's going to be secret versus everyone seeing seeing him when he comes. So he gives these four uh, illustrations or parables. Again, the first one uh, from verse 43, we would say, are we seeing the signs around us that lead up to Jesus coming? Because the exhortation is to be watching, to be alert. Uh, the, again, apostles live that way. Christians for 2,000 years have, uh, have lived that way. And I have to tell you, uh, we, you know, we've lived that way since we were brand new believers. And and uh, we are fascinated by Bible prophecy. There were things happening in the Middle East then and so forth. And, um, uh, I, and I just know that there, there were things early on, decisions made early on uh, in terms of uh, uh, our, our serving the Lord or not serving the Lord. It was all based on, it was all predicated on, I thought that might be the only shot because the Lord could come at any time. I remember the first time somebody asked me to, in this little... Um, retreat uh, setting and there was only going to be maybe i don't know 35 people in the room or something like that maybe 40 at the most they wanted me to get up and share a little bible verse and a couple of things and i was scared to death and there's only one reason i did it and that's because i felt like if i don't <laughs> and the rapture comes and if i stand before the lord and say i'm sorry i was just I was too filled full of anxiety like this guy. I just couldn't do it. I, I just, I just could, I couldn't see myself standing. I didn't want to stand before the Lord and say, sorry. I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be my only chance. And I really thought it might be my only chance. So I did it. And I, I'm sure it was lousy and I was scared to death. And I'm sure it was horrible. But, uh, but, it, but, you know, those things, same thing, teaching a Bible study, 
Bill asked me to do announcements. I mean, any of those things. I mean, when I did announcements for the first time, I was glad there was a pulpit. You know that figure of speech, your knees knocking together? My knees were knocking together. I thought that was a figure of speech. That happens. But uh, the, only, the only reason, we, you know, I kind of took these, what for me were giant steps of faith. Because I believe the rapture could occur at any time. And I was going to have to stand before the Lord. And I was going to have to give an account, just like this, this, these parables are talking about. So the first one is to, uh, to be, uh, be alert, uh, be watchful. Second parable about the faithful servant, uh, what caused the servant's downfall, something went wrong in his heart. He stopped expecting uh, the Lord to return. Uh, let me just say is that we've been living that way for 30 years now. I, by the way, I have no regrets. I have, if somebody said, yeah, but if somebody had told you, hey, it, it's going to be at least 30 years from now, uh, would you lived any differently? I wouldn't have wanted to. Uh, I'm thankful we've uh, we've kind of always lived uh, lived that way. Uh, don't don't let your heart grow cold in terms of uh, the rapture of the church. Uh, the third parable, chapter 25. Uh, again, the the wedding, uh, uh, the primary way we're ready for the Lord's return is to receive Him as our Lord and Savior. There were people that went with the bridegroom they were ready for the wedding and there were people without the oil without the holy spirit that weren't again christian all christians go in the rapture um non-christians don't even if they attended church on a real regular basis <laughs> it's just that simple uh people are uh, know the lord or or they don't know the lord uh, the fourth parable the parable of the talents again Talent represents opportunity to use our abilities. God assigns work and opportunity according to ability. Uh, again, the three servants either were, were faithful or they were unfaithful, and the exhortation is to be faithful and, uh, and, and, and live uh, with this idea that uh, the rapture can occur. There are no prophetic events that need to take place. Um, there, there might be some other things. We might see the Magog invasion. Uh, we might see that happen. And, um, you know, with, with what's going on in the Middle East right now, I, I heard Prime, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu say very early on that we have to deal with Hamas, but the big issue is Iran, building nuclear weapons. So, yeah, we have to deal with this, but this is not our main concern. Our main concern is Iran. And um, it sure looks like Israel is going to have to go it alone, although they're going to get some help from Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, flyover, refueling, and so forth. Uh, but it doesn't look like they're going to get any help from the United States in terms of going after and attacking Iran and taking out their nuclear facilities. And when that happens, uh, all those Russian scientists and their families that are living around those facilities are going to get killed right along with them. And I just got a feeling that Mr. Putin isn't going to be real thrilled about that. And... Um, and that juncture, uh, that could be the, the impetus or the thing that causes or triggers the Magog invasion, which is Russia, ancient Persia, Iran, uh, and a host of other, uh, again, Islamic nations that jump in with them. We, we might see that, but we, may, we might not. We might be gone uh, be, before then. But uh, it's good to be watching, uh, and it's good to live uh, as though uh, this, this could be it, you know, when there's... When there's opportunities to do something for the Lord, there's opportunities to witness for the Lord. Um, uh, the rapture is is the thing that uh, comes to, uh, should come to mind, and it uh, again we we just read, read very quickly. But the First Thessalonians four sixteen to eighteen passage uh, was not written to establish a doctrine; it was written to bring comfort to people's hearts, uh, to know that hey, that is going to happen, and we are going to be reunited in a moment of time and space with every loved one that's gone gone before us. And so the rapture of the church is meant to bring great comfort to our hearts as well. Amen. Well, let's, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, we can sit here and study this tonight and, and go through these things and feel like we have a pretty good understanding of uh, what your word says here in terms of these parables. Lord, I pray that we would receive the exhortation to be watchful, to be alert. Uh, Lord, that uh, that would be in our hearts and minds. Uh, and we do get busy uh, just living life and going through the weeks. And 
it's easy to forget and take our eyes off the eternal perspective. So I pray that uh, you would help us do that, Lord. And um, these, uh, these exhortations would have uh, real meaning and maybe some, some real change uh, in our attitudes and in actions as a result of our study tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.